Hi guys, and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to talk about the connection between SIBO and hypothyroidism and beg the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Do you need to treat both in order to treat your SIBO successfully or your hypothyroidism successfully? Stay tuned to find out. All right, first and foremost, let me share a couple of deets with you, and we'll talk about the prevalence of SIBO amongst people with hypothyroidism and the prevalence of hypothyroidism amongst those with SIBO. Yes, two different ways to look at this data, but either way you shake it, the data does suggest that both conditions are more prevalent if you have the other. So as a starting point, there was a good article, I'll link it down below, there, I'll link both of these for that matter, there was a more recent study in 2017, which I already did a whole video on about the levothyroxine SIBO link. But one of the things that they came out of that study saying is that hypothyroidism is associated with SIBO to a point where when they looked at their group of data, they said that if you have SIBO, the likelihood of having hypothyroidism is about 9.7%. And if you did not have SIBO in their study, the likelihood of being hypothyroid was about 4%. So really rough math, it's about two and a half times more likely that you have hypothyroidism if you have a SIBO diagnosis. So one point to make right out the get-go is that if you've been diagnosed with SIBO and you have not had your thyroid tested in the last year or two or maybe ever, my gosh, get your thyroid tested, look for TSH, T4, T3, get a full thyroid panel because there is about a two and a half fold likelihood, higher likelihood, that you could be hypothyroid as opposed to the average Joe Schmo that you just pick off the street. Now let's look at the data going the other direction. So amongst people with confirmed hypothyroidism, what is the likelihood that they will have SIBO? And that is a much more clear distinction. If you are currently hypothyroid, there's about a 54% likelihood that you have SIBO according to this data set versus the control group, which only had about a 5% incidence of SIBO. So that's a pretty profound difference. That's about a tenfold difference in likelihood of having SIBO if you are hypothyroid versus the average Joe or Jane America. So pretty distinct too, to a point where I would also recommend that if you are hypothyroid, it is very much worth your while to get evaluated for SIBO or at least do a quick look over at what the SIBO symptoms are and how to know if you have it so you know if you should have a conversation about getting tested. Because there is probably around a 50% likelihood that you could have SIBO if you are indeed hypothyroid. So pretty, pretty statistically significant numbers on both fronts. And now let's talk a little bit about how the two can be connected and where you start to parse this apart so that you can have the best treatment plan possible. So you can see over here, I've just drawn hypothyroidism and SIBO, and we're going to draw some arrows connecting the two. So ways that hypothyroidism can lead to an increased likelihood of SIBO, or importantly, keep you stuck in SIBO Neverland and give you a really hard time healing your SIBO if this goes unaddressed. So first and foremost, the thyroid is obviously needed for Metabolism, that's the biggest thing that it's known for. This little butterfly gland is the star of the show when we talk about metabolism. So hypothyroidism can cause things like unwanted weight gain or just difficulty losing weight. It can cause uh, fatigue and just like a sluggish feeling because the metabolism in your cells is actually slowed down. The DNA transcription gets slowed down if you don't have adequate thyroid hormone. And the cell turnover becomes important because cell turnover, you know, we think of it as far as like skin and nails and hair and things that we could visually see growing and repairing themselves. But that cellular repair and turnover actually becomes really, really important for the gut. Because remember, you should have a brand new gut every three or maybe four days, right? So cell turnover becomes important because maybe Maybe you have a little bit of leaky gut and you don't have hypothyroidism and then you could repair your gut lining in three or four days. But maybe you have leaky gut and you're also hypothyroid and now it takes you potentially weeks to heal that tissue because your cell repair processes, your cell turnover and metabolism is just kind of bleh, man. Another thing too 
in a similar vein is that the nervous system really, really likes to have adequate levels of thyroid hormone. So if you think about, oh, I'm going to give up trying to write all of these. Actually, that's too sloppy. But if you think about a lot of our conversations thus far, we've talked about motility, the vagus nerve, the enteric nervous system, even just like brain health and the tie-in with things like anxiety. You need a healthy nervous system if you're going to treat SIBO. And hypothyroidism is associated with increased rates of depression, again, fatigue and brain fog. It's like the brain doesn't have its juice to function at optimal, and it's just not as active. It's not as awake. It's not as stimulated, which means that important pathways like the vagus nerve just don't get the stimulation that they need to really do a super good job. Another element, which can be related to the nervous system. Um, there. Oh, that's not a good S. There we go. Nervous S. That'll have to do. Another thing that could be tied with the nervous system thing and also its own separate entity as far as SIBO goes is slowing down of the bowels and causing constipation. Constipation is probably the number one symptom seen amongst hypothyroid patients and it's not a coincidence that there's an increased likelihood of SIBO. So, you know, if, if you think about it this way, think about the way that SIBO is most often talked about in the functional space, the GI space. So remember how I always draw this with, you know, lips up here, esophagus, stomach, small bowel, colon, right? If you've seen my other videos, you've seen this depiction before. And my normal shtick is that you should have a lot of bacteria and yeast and critters in your colon, but not so much in the small bowel. They should be just peppered throughout the rest of the digestive tube. But with SIBO, oftentimes we think of this creeping up into the ileum, maybe the jejunum, and it's the bacteria are coming up from the colon, so we think, in some of the cases of SIBO. Well, if you're constipated because you're hypothyroid, like say, for example, I have had patients tell me that they poop maybe once a week, and even that isn't a good poop. It's kind of a marbly, rabbit pellety poop. Say you are literally full of shit. <laughs> My dad would crack up because uh, he always loved telling people that. But think about it. If you're literally up to your eyebrows in poo, that it's going to be much easier for the bacteria to translocate and go up into the small bowel. And I have had patients tell me that they have constipation and they have SIBO and they seem to kind of come and go together, but they're distinct entities. I remember one patient telling me that she really felt like the constipation would precede a SIBO flare by a couple of days or a couple of weeks. She would get constipated, she would get built up and backed up, and then the SIBO stuff would start to flare. Then she would get bloated and she couldn't look at an onion cross-eyed without bloating up or she would get inflamed feeling. And I think it's because the bacteria have an easier time translocating up into the small bowel if you're up to your eyebrows with poo. So. The constipation thing can be related to the nervous system involvement and the motility thing that's very much important for treating SIBO, but it can also be its own little predisposing risk factor because you literally get backed up if you are constipated. And that is a very, very common complaint amongst people who have SIBO. And now let's look at this from the other direction. Let's think, how could SIBO, the presence of SIBO, affect hypothyroidism or cause it, or again, make it much more difficult to adequately treat hypothyroidism if you do not treat the SIBO. So hold on, I need my little eraser. So let's erase this ugly picture first. So all right, let's think of ways that these two are connected. Well, first of all, we know that SIBO is inherently inflammatory and that in and of itself can potentially do some damage to that little gland and make it harder for that gland to produce thyroid hormone. But a really key component of that inflammation, it's kind of a little offshoot, is the autoimmune disease component. So remember, about 90 or 95% of people who are hypothyroid, in fact, have an autoimmune disease called Hashimoto's. And if you are inflamed or deficient or toxic to a certain point, you can launch into a full-blown autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's, which eventually will make you go hypothyroid. 
because the immune system has been attacking the thyroid gland potentially for years by the time you get diagnosed with the hypothyroidism. So the inflammation and the immune imbalance, the immune perturbations coming up from the gut if you have SIBO can be really quite profound. Similarly, uh, let's see, how do I draw this? The thyroid does not operate in a vacuum. So the best way to think of this, picture this bubble being the actual thyroid. No, actually, that doesn't work. All right, bear with me. Let me cram this on here. So here's your brain. And it's, there we go. There's a the thyroid, right? Thyroid hormone doesn't just get made for funsies. It's not like the thyroid gland actually knows what to do all on its own. You actually have some nervous system involvement. And what we measure as TSH on standard lab work is actually made by a part of your nervous system. And it's your nervous system telling the thyroid, hey, make more juice. We need thyroid hormone. Please thank you. So if you think about this too, with the inflammation, not only can inflammation cause autoimmune disease, which can then launch you into hypothyroidism via Hashimoto's, but that inflammation can also do a real, um, a, a, a real I don't, damage. I don't know. I was going to come up with something clever, but it escaped my brain. The inflammation can be very detrimental to your nervous system, which I'll just put as NS because I'm lazy, but your nervous system needs to work in order to give your thyroid gland the, the execution order. You have to tell the gland what to do. So some people, not the majority, but some people are hypothyroid because that brain thyroid connection is not working as adequately as it should. And it's like the thyroid gland is just not getting the memo that it needs to do its job. So for some people, this nervous system component becomes really, really important. And either way you shake a stick at it, the inflammation ends up driving a lot of this for people. Another piece, of course, is the presence of nutritional deficiencies that swoop in as well. So I'll just put newt def. They'll have to deal with my notes. I don't know. So think about this too. High, high prevalence of things like iron deficiency, uh, vitamin D deficiency, magnesium deficiency, zinc deficiency, vitamin B12, um, thiamine, vitamin B1. There's a lot of nutrients that can become depleted if you have SIBO, especially if it's unmanaged SIBO that's been there for potentially years and years. But there's a high likelihood that you have at least one nutritional inadequacy or deficiency, or that you have some degree of malabsorption or maldigestion. Maybe you're not digesting your protein super adequately. Maybe you're not digesting your fat super adequately. The nutritional deficiencies can cause inflammation, but also it can rob the thyroid gland and the brain and the nervous system of the things that they need to function. So you could actually just be hypothyroid because of something like iodine deficiency. It's not common, but I did see a patient not more than two years ago, I would say, and she had worked with me already for some time. We had some baseline labs and she said, she sent me a message and said, I think I have a goiter, but I might be losing my mind. Can you check it out? She had a whopper of a goiter sent her off her lab work. Her TSH was 12. We talked about diet and literally my only recommendation on that day was start using iodized salt again. I think you're actually iodine deficient. And she did. And six weeks later, her TSH was back to normal at one point something and the goiter was gone. So you don't underestimate the presence of nutritional deficiencies. And that could either be caused by dietary restriction, as was the case with this patient, because she had read that sea salt was better, yada, yada, yada or it can be because of the SIBO itself and the malabsorption and the maldigestion and the low enzyme output and the low bile output, et cetera, that goes into that. And that segues beautifully into my next point. And I'm running out of room for all of these beautiful, beautiful pictures here, but th this will have to do is don't underestimate the power of things like enzymes. And I'm just gonna put, let's see, I'm just gonna write juices. Don't forget your digestive juices. So this might be related to the vagus nerve, nervous system thing, or it might be related to the inflammation or the nutritional deficiencies, or it could just be its own thing. But hypothyroid patients, 
very frequently have low output of things like stomach acid, bile, and possibly pancreatic enzymes, particularly bile. Bile is a biggie for hypothyroid, and I would actually argue that we should add a whole nother arrow going this direction for bile alone, because the incidence of gallstones amongst people who are hypothyroid is very high. Compared to the general population, I don't have the stats for this video off the top of my head, but many more people who are hypothyroid get gallstones, and it's related to the thyroid condition. But of course, that's going to mean that you have poor bile flow, and then that affects your motility, and then that sets the stage for SIBO. And you can see where it's a very tangled web between these two. But I would argue that successful treatment of one necessitates successful treatment of the other. In my opinion, if you are hypothyroid and it goes undiagnosed and unmanaged, you're going to have a heck of a time trying to treat your SIBO. If you are not able to properly account for things like bile, the cell turnover and tissue healing speed, the nervous system stuff, the digestive juices, the, the brain thyroid axis. I mean, it's such a tangled web. And the thing about hormones, all of them, but especially thyroid hormone, is that hormones interact with every cell of your body in ways that we probably don't even understand yet. So you can't really separate the thyroid thing from the SIBO thing. And research both directions proves that people with SIBO are more likely to be hypothyroid and people with hypothyroidism are much more likely to have SIBO. So I really don't think that you can separate the two. Of course, with conventional medicine and the backbone of society being conventional medicine, of course, they like to pretend that you can just, you know, do that and sever the two and say, nope, you go to the endocrinologist for your thyroid and you go to the GI doctor for your SIBO and then bada bing, bada boom, you're done. And I just don't think that's true. So as always, guys, I really hope that this video helps you understand the connectedness of your body, how to treat your SIBO, how to treat your hypothyroidism, how to marry the two together so that you can have a complete and actually life-changing treatment plan. I mean, isn't that the game that we're all in here trying to change lives? I really hope that this helps you understand the connectedness between the two and helps you develop a treatment plan so that you can treat your SIBO or treat your hypothyroidism adequately and completely. As always, I will see you in the next video. But of course, I would love to hear your feedback. Have you worked with somebody on your SIBO to no avail and then lo and behold, you get diagnosed with hypothyroidism and it's like this big light bulb moment? Or have you been trying to treat your hypothyroidism potentially for years or decades only to find out, hey, surprise, you have SIBO? I've heard stories from both. I've heard people who have been hypothyroid for 10 or more years and then they get diagnosed with SIBO and then it all makes sense. And I've heard people who have tried to do conventional GI treatment, rifaximin, whatever, for SIBO, only to later be diagnosed hypothyroid by me when we actually go get around to running the labs. So I would love to hear your stories and your experience with this because I've seen it run both ways in my clinic. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.